Palki, you are that person, a graduate or post graduate in journalism and mass comm from uh, Jaipur. I mean, small town girl uh, holds a degree in French. Very evident from the, um, I think the pronunciation. Whenever you speak French on TV, one can easily make out. Um, you um, talk from geopolitics to climate change to space missions to social media trends. Um, you pick on topics which are super relevant. And with super confidence that you have uh, in the public speaking sphere, I really want to know about it. And I'm sure a lot of women want to know about it. So welcome, Palki. Thank you so much. Thank you. So how did it all start for you? I mean, were you always that confident, Palki, who's sitting in front of, you know, billions of people today and changing lives? Or how did your journey really unfold? No, I was not always this confident. I had uh, my moments, very many of them, where I felt that I was uh, was doubting myself. Um, I started uh, performing on stage very early in life. uh, And for that, I would give credit to my mother, even uh, in things that I I was not very good. Like she made me participate in a lot of dance performances. I still have two left feet, I'm horrible, but she thought I was a great dancer and I could do it. So she pushed me to do it and I did it. And when you start early, uh, yes, there is pressure, but you also you also realize that there will be moments when things will not go your way or the way you'd planned, but you just have to keep going. Um, and stage fear goes away. I remember uh, I was going for uh, for a debate competition in college and uh, I had written it and my teacher had said that it was very well written. And then just before uh, I was going to go on stage, she called me aside and she said, I want you to sit down, forget about everything, take a deep breath Mm -hmm. and then take one more and one more. And don't think about anyone and just go and say what you have to say. Mm -hmm. So that's where it starts. Mm -hmm. And then slowly you get used to it. And uh, the more you know the subject, Uh, the more confident you are. So you would have seen that once journalists start doing it day in and day out, um, they can report from anywhere. There is a crowd behind you. People are cheering. People are shouting slogans, all sorts of things. You just follow your train of thought and you say what you have to say. So it becomes, it comes with practice, I guess. So did you join the traditional, um, you know, journalism, like journalism, writing for columns in the paper, or what did you actually do to finally sit on, you know, the chair that you're sitting today? Were you always groomed to do it? Or did you start with like, you know, what most journalists do, like trying to be in the battlefield, Uh, you know, they aspire to be, but I don't know how you started. Uh, No, when I started, things were a little different. I think uh, TV news was still... uh, finding its feet, uh, 24 hour news channels were a very new thing. Uh, I'm talking about 20 20 years ago, yeah. Um, And I I always say that I'm a journalist by accident, but I love being where I am uh, once that happy accident happened. So I was approached uh, by Doordarshan to do a show, uh, to do a news broadcast. uh, And they said, I will have to search for an interview first and see how I perform. And I, I don't think I was very good with the interview. I did not, I I was in college and I thought it was just for fun and let's just go and see what happens. Uh, But uh, I found some very good mentors very early in my career. And they told me that I have to take it seriously that all all jobs are serious business. And uh, I have potential and I should uh, focus. So that's where I began. Uh, So I started television straight away from the anchor's chair, which is not done anymore now. In hindsight, if I could have done it differently, maybe I would have been a reporter first, gone through the grind a little more and then gone on to become an anchor that gives you more confidence, more depth and so on. But those were the times and well, it didn't turn out so bad uh, <laughs> looking back. Uh, but I did write for uh, uh, for Hindustan Times as well for a while. And uh, I, in the years that followed, I have done uh, some reporting if not, if not a lot, I do go once in a while outside on the field and do things. Uh, but I would say that I've, uh, I've done, I, I've been in all parts of a television newsroom. So I've been on the desk, I've been on the reporter's desk, I've been on the anchor's chair. Um, I have uh, over the past couple of years also done the editorial work. So I understand basically uh, TV now. And uh, yeah, we all take different parts, but 
this but was fine. How does that happen when you actually aspire to be covering Afghanistan sometime? Or, you know, at least I know that my daughter is also studying uh, media and journalism and that's all she talks about. So uh, where is that aspiration taking all the journalists? Uh, I think everyone who, uh, who goes into this business uh, or this field uh, basically goes because they want to tell uh, those stories in their voice, in their words, with their, uh, you know, they want, to, they want to experience it firsthand. Mm -hmm. and say it yeah so that is a huge draw uh at the same time uh if you have 200 odd people in running a channel i think only 20 come on air mm -hmm. and once you learn how media functions you realize that those 20 are not necessarily the most important people yeah there are there are very important contributors who do not come on screen. And I, I think that, that somehow they are uh, they're better professionals than us. Because once you're on the screen or once you get a byline in the paper, you get, you get hooked to the idea. Hmm. But think of the person who is writing your story or who is editing your story or making your graphics or you know, part of the technical team. Their face, their name never appears, but they own the product and they want to make it look good. And those are the people who make uh, uh, TV channels and newspapers successful. But yes, when people start out, everyone wants to hold that mic and say, reporting from such and ah. such place, right? such and there is a there is a thrill to it. I wouldn't deny that. Yeah. Yes. So uh, going back to where you started, of course, you know, it was a very regular news reading till some years ago. So how did you think of this you know, like you need to evolve um, news as a subject and where people actually get much more of their time because everything is value around right now. I'm spending time on the screen when I can do so many other things, maybe. Why should I listen to those rubbish debates sometimes which really gives me headache because do I really need to be there? And then it's really something that you have brought in. So where, where did you think of this idea how did Gravitas come into shape? And it's, it's a really very powerful platform, I have to say. Thank you. You hit the nail on the head when you said, why should I spend my time watching it when I can do so many other things? Yeah. So that is the rule of thumb that we follow. Uh, will you watch the story you're showing to the audience? Yeah. If it, were your day, if it were to be your day off or if you were on a vacation or if you were in a different profession, uh, would you watch this news bulletin that you've produced today? If you wouldn't, then you should not do it. Mm. And uh, so I realized that uh, for a long time, I was doing the kind of shows that I wouldn't watch. And if someone said that they had watched me on TV, I would be mildly embarrassed. <laughs> but oh my God, <laughs> what did you hear me say? And uh, well, that's not how civilized people talk. Mm. Uh, also, um, that was also the time when my children are still growing up, but that was the time when I was telling them don't interrupt people in the middle of a sentence and so on and so forth. And I realized that I'm doing those things. And uh, I did not want to do, I did not want to do them. I was not enjoying that. I was not enjoying the, the noise. Uh, I did not like being the person I was not mm -hmm. on screen. Um, I like to have decent conversations. I like reading. I like, I like talking to people who bring value in the time that we are spending. And I think that should translate on TV as well. And so, and also because there is such a glut of uh, content. So if, if you are to be, so that's, that's the personal uh, reason why I thought that this has to stop. So I did actually take a break and I, I, I said, I don't want to do this and I don't want to turn into a caricature of myself. That's not who I am. Um, and then I also, uh, because one is uh, a student of media and one wants to understand how the media business works, uh, anyone you speak to will tell you that this is the, the media and then the news media is like a tiny sliver of the circle. Everyone else is watching entertainment. So people are watching, uh, my favorite example is the Chernobyl documentary on, news, uh, on Netflix, but they will not watch a story on Chernobyl on a news channel. So what can we do to change that? 
Yeah. And that's where, and I realized that there are, there are many like-minded people, but we've become a victim of our own template in the news business. And that is why we thought that we need to have a show which is different, a show which aligns with our personality and thought process. Mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll find viewers. And initially uh, when we proposed the idea, it did not find many takers, especially, you know, businesses are, are wary of taking risks, especially with people who have not proven to be huge successes. Um, if today a, a, a top performer in a company says, I want to start such and such thing, maybe he'll get funding because people will say, okay, he's proved himself somewhere else. But for, for a bunch of people who are relatively uh, not the toppers to come and say, we want to do a show which is not, uh, which does not have a debate, which does not have uh, unnecessary guests, for want of a better word. I mean, with all due respect to the guests who come on television, but, but some of them are not adding value. So we thought that we will do something else. We will tell stories that impact people. We will tell stories that uh, interest people um, from a six-year-old to a 60-year-old. And somewhere we've been able to, to achieve that. I, I told you that I, I, got, a, I got two uh, messages in one week, one from a nine-year-old in Bangalore who said that she watches uh, Gravitas with her whole family and one from a 90-year-old in Texas. So that is quite heartening. So I think our formula has worked and we have found our tribe. Yes, I think that uh, especially the 90 year old story was very moving, especially when I think um, he had tears in his eyes when you said happy birthday to that old gentleman. You made his day, my dear. So <laughs> transform lives, so that's so beautiful. You should put out such stories, by the way. I didn't see the story out. You, you must do On it. social media? Uh, yeah, I thought I will ask his family and him if, if <laughs> it was okay with them because I didn't want to, I don't know how. People have different ideas about what is privacy to them. And it was a very uh, private moment, I think. Uh, he was quite moved and maybe I'll ask and, and I'll share. Uh, I do get some very interesting, I remember I was in Dubai uh, last year and uh, some some school girl came to see me hmm. and I think the hotel staff did not call or they did or I did not get the call or something happened and she must have waited for a while and then she had to go to school so she left a long letter with lots of you know ah. things done with sketch pens and it was so touching it came to me with the newspapers in the morning and um, I was very moved that that she thought of doing this so so that's when you really feel rewarded yeah you know more than all the numbers and all of those uh, parameters that we track to see if we are doing well uh, it's uh, it's these messages from people and and what am i giving them what are they giving me but it's just that and then you feel uh, you feel that you have established a connect yes and it also brings a sense of responsibility i think I think so, because I think the way you translate news uh, goes deep inside, I have to say. You want to know more and you want to know, okay, from where is this news coming? So, you know, I can also create a, you know, a change my own perspective towards things. And I have done that also watching your news, to be honest. So many things get cleared out to say, oh my goodness, yeah, that makes sense. So you're doing a fantastic job, my friend, and please do it and continue to do it. But now that you're so famous, I want to ask you, <clears throat> how are you handling fame and uh, being uh, you know, known so much? How are your kids taking it? Do they know that their mom is so popular? Uh, are you uh, keeping like, you know, them isolated or insulated? I'm trying to, but this is the generation of the internet. And uh, yesterday, um, my daughter was telling me that that uh, her French teacher asked. Uh, she she pointed out two children who who she said were their pronunciation was good, better than the others, and she asked, uh, "Do you have someone who speaks French at home?" And she said, "Yes, my mother does." And uh, she said, I, "I just said my mother does." And my teacher asked, "What does your mother do?" And she said, "Suddenly, a couple of my classmates just hijacked you, mom." And it's like you're their mom and not mine. And they started telling the teacher everything about you and they, and they showed Google images of you and your Twitter page and they shared. And, and she's like, I felt like I can introduce my mother too. So that's <laughs> nice. 
<laughs> but at the same time, I think your family is your anchor because they've known you in the good times and the bad times and they've seen your struggles uh, and the things that do not show on the screen. Uh, so they keep you grounded. Uh, mm -hmm. My mother is one of them who daily tells me uh, that I'm doing well and she's proud of me, but I should not take it uh, too seriously. <laughs> uh, what goes up comes down. Uh, that helps. Uh, my brother, um, my kids too, yeah. So for them, uh, no matter what, and for, that's, that's true, I think, for any parent, no matter what you do in your professional uh, career, at home, you're just their mother or their father. And that's all that they expect, everything from you uh, that, they, that any child would expect from a parent. So yes, it's nice. Sometimes it's challenging. Um, but... Uh, but it's okay. And I'm not feeling any of that. You, you're being very kind. Um, <laughs> you say you're famous and so on. But it's just this social media is also an echo chamber. We live in this bubble and we feel, okay, everyone's listening to me and everyone's responding. But really, it's a much, much larger world out there. But do you believe in this power of brand you? We just, um, you know, I had like a little workshop yesterday with a person who spoke a lot about how putting yourself out there is so important. Do you think that is for you as well? That you power of what? the power of brand you like basically about yourself uh, and putting yourself out there your work because like you said that you're not only you know a news reader you are carrying responsibility of changing minds of like changing perceptions of like bringing in more value to what people are hearing and listening so do you think it's important for people who also get you know to in a certain point in life to also you know, be out there to just bring yourself more open because you're a very close person that my question is that you normally would not say much about yourself. We know about your work, but do you think that it will be nice if people know a little more about Palki, her, what she likes to do, uh, what brings her this um, aura and, you know, what, what, what have you got really or done for yourself to be here in this position so that so many people can be you're really inspirational for them? You know, one thing is that uh, it, it works both ways. Uh, I don't want to uh, live in this um, assumption that everyone's interested in my life and every little thing I do. It takes, uh, although uh, for all those in television, we have that little bit of narcissism, like watch me, watch my show, I'm the best. So you should come and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, listen to my news or whatever I'm telling you. So that is there. Without it, you cannot survive in this media business. Uh, but uh, it's very important to not overdo it, I think, because then you become too full of yourself. So I'm trying to strike that balance somewhere and tell myself that that I do, I do share what I have to share uh, with a closer circle. I'm not sure how much it helps, but uh, I guess at a certain point in life, you should uh, put yourself out there in the sense that you should, you should share your convictions uh, your struggles more than your successes mm -hmm. uh, because because when you do that you give a lot of people hope yeah. that it's not an easy journey for anyone and if this person can go through xyz things and still make it then maybe i can too so at a certain point you should uh, like i told you earlier you should you should think about paying it forward like we learn from the struggles of some people and the stories of some people Right. And it's important to then pay it forward and, and, and give ideas or at least trigger some thoughts in, in the next generation or the people who are following you. So it is important to share, I would say, um, your struggles more than your successes. Yeah, that is true. I totally agree that when you put yourself out there in the most authentic manner, I think that's where even the connect comes. Otherwise, then you're like a person who's just performing and um, then I don't know who you are and what do I learn from you, to be honest. And more failures in life, more, more learnings and more successes thereon. I have learned it the hard way as well in the last two years um, and still doing. So I don't know if my failures will come more, but I want to stop here now. Sometimes I feel God, was, that's it. Okay, like I have gone through this now. That's it, be kind to me. Yeah, so Palki, uh, what do you have to say to um, aspirational women? Because um, there is, you know, everybody talks about inclusion diversity, and that talks a lot about including women. But 
this topic has always fascinated me that why should women be treated somewhere you know differently and why should the topic of inclusion diversity have women in the forum because if they should be anyway treated equal so what are your thoughts on giving a platform to women um how can they aspire to be in certain positions what should they do what are your learnings in your from your own life so to borrow one um, term from Sheryl Sandberg women should lean in make themselves heard uh they will be judged they should not women should not expect an easy ride uh, an easy uh, journey hmm. nobody is going to make way nobody is going to stop talking for you to make your point you have to make your point when you want to so that's important to uh to say what you want to say and do what you want to do when you want to do it um women have to learn to ask for things wow uh the right pay the right space uh the right opportunities i see a lot of times uh when i'm when i'm working on appraisals or when i'm hiring people uh men are the first ones to say that i get paid this much and i expect this much more or uh, i have worked for so many years and i want to lead such and such team and that's absolutely fair and yeah. women assume that somebody will notice their work yeah and give them what they deserve so like someone said that men are judged on their potential and women are judged on their performance and that's the bias that unfortunately we live with uh, and it's not just developing countries or societies like ours it's it's across the board you look at fortune 500 companies how many of them are headed by women um biology is not on our side but the thing that is on our side is that women have a lot of strength mm -hmm. and that shows in the way they juggle a lot of roles uh they produce babies which is not an easy process no matter what medical science achieves um uh, it is a it it takes mental and physical toughness nice. to do that uh so why can't it be a uh, part of their professional lives as well if they want something they just have to go for it no one is giving it to them on a platter so we should stop feeling sorry for ourselves and pick up our pen or our whatever it is that we have and and just uh, go for it i think uh and and this our generation and the generation that is following we really don't have an excuse honestly mm -hmm. we have been given more or less the same education as others at least you and i and a lot of other women we know yeah. and we uh tend to take it for granted at some level and that's wrong all the women who are who are dropping out of the workforce today thinking that okay i've done enough and maybe i don't want to do any more or i have a good family i have a good space i know at the end of the day it's about your choice but you're making the wrong choice because by making that choice you're doing a disservice to an entire generation of women who will follow you and still find only men as bosses yeah so all the women who are working today i would ask them to go the whole hog and not quit midway sometimes it appears very tough you've quit i've quit you come back hmm. and i would like to believe we've done better when we've come back and so it's important to have that faith and uh, this is this is our service to other women i think Absolutely. that when more women are at the top of the ladder they will help other women rise But do you also feel that although i totally understand when lean in was written and you know with the good intention of that women should lean in and should help but do you see that there is still a certain amount of now uh, what should i say we are not as open to help as well we um, are still restricted when it comes to helping other women to succeed but you are mentoring a lot of women how do you see that transition when you mentor are they able to take it forward um are they also becoming leaders of like you know leaning in and uh, supporting or do you they are they are more confident uh, we started an exercise where we um, you know when we first started our meetings for for gravitas i used to come with a list but i used to ask everyone else to suggest stories okay. and they wouldn't talk 
and uh, there was a lot of inhibition. I don't know why. And there were a couple of people who I'd worked with very closely who were very open with me. And I asked them, what is it about me that that is not making people talk? Hmm. Because I know they talk otherwise. So why don't they talk in a meeting? And they said that uh, most bosses don't ask for suggestions and don't actually incorporate those suggestions that they're given. So they don't know. They're trying to figure it out. Give them time. No. Okay. And it worked because now uh, I have people who shoot down my ideas all the time and say, <laughs> I'm not convinced. And this is why you should not do it. And I like that. And I like, and I've also seen that when you give people their due, men and women, and when you encourage them and when you give them positive reinforcement, they always deliver more than you expected them to. They always deliver more than they have to in their, they will not stick to the, I'm not saying like don't have a life, but they will always try to do a little more hmm. because they own the product and they own the project. And I've seen that in women as well. Uh, yes, it takes time. And yes, I agree with you that sometimes women do not help other women grow. Um, I don't know. Uh, I also feel that it's because uh, we have a much smaller sample size of women who have, who are in that position to help other women grow. I think uh, when you achieve a certain level of success and more than success, when you achieve a certain level of self-confidence and mm -hmm. self-assurance that I'm here and no one is going to push me off if I look the other way, then you become a little more magnanimous and you say, okay, I will now help others. So I think we need to give women that space and time to really become comfortable in their positions. Yeah, it's tough I, fighting you know, in a boardroom full of men all the time. Yeah, so true. So tell me one book that has really brought in a lot of thinking, uh, introspection, or some kind of a shift in you. You read so many. How do you firstly, uh, like, you know, put everything? Do you just read for reading? Do you read for an impact? Or is there anything that shifted in you by any book? Yeah, I, it's very hard to pick one book. In our last conversation, someone asked me about three books and I couldn't think of three books because <laughs> it's very tough. And uh, books shape you at uh, different stages of your career and, and age. Uh, there was a time when I thought uh, Scarlett O'Hara was the best thing in the world. Uh, <laughs> gone with the wind. I thought, my God, this woman has so much grit and she can take on. And, and she was not your moral, ideal lady. Mm, yes, But she did what she wanted to. And I thought, she is a heroine, yes. Or um, I was quite inspired by The Fountainhead. Nice. Um, later in life, I've... Uh, off later, I've been trying to read the Upanishads. It's been my two-year project. I'm, it's, it's going very slow. But the more I read, the more I realize that this is so rich. And why did I not do it earlier? Mm. And um, I try to tell some of those stories to my children and they, they're like, don't start this again. But, <laughs> but, but those stories are life-changing. And I would say there's one book you asked me that, that really has deeply impacted me. I would say it's the Mahabharata. Oh. Because it has something for, uh, for everyone. Yeah. And it has every situation and every scenario and uh, it's giving you options and it's telling you what is the path of dharma and what is a dharma and what you need to do. And I remember I was in a talk with some students uh, and they asked me about, uh, about diplomacy and strategy. And again, I quoted the Mahabharata and I said, uh, look at Krishna, he, <laughs> you know, he, the kind of things he said, all of that is part of our strategic, it is becoming a part of our strategic culture. So at every level in life, uh, I don't know if this is the answer you expected, but the Mahabharata is my go-to book for a lot of things. No, absolutely. I think it talks about human psychology, the way we think, uh, the relationships, uh, you know, the way we it's perform. Really it's so layered. It's, uh, yeah. it's great. 
and the manipulations as well. So it's not only about, uh, you know, just being a good boy or a good girl. It was all about manipulations and how you actually, you know. Um, so the means, I, the, the end justifies the means in some cases. That's yeah. what, yeah. how they explain. So Palki, thanks so much for your time. Uh, this is such a nice, I don't want you to go, but um, you know, keeping track of the time that I promised. I just want you to leave uh, people who are hearing us with something, something that you learn probably in life, uh, something that you uh, do in your own personal life to be the person that you are. I think that'll be a good sign off. Um, wow. <laughs> You didn't prepare me for this. Um, what should I say? I should say read a lot. That really opens up your mind. Try to find clarity in what you want from life. And a lot of answers will reveal themselves. Once you know that this is what I'm about and this is what I want, everything else falls into place. We struggle because we don't know where we're going. Hmm. and so how do you get that clarity i have a question on that because you say you you should seek clarity but i don't know i want clarity what do i do for that uh you you figure out what is the most important thing for you for me uh it is important for me to be challenged constantly right it is important for me to be inspired um i'm a very creative person and uh I get over things very quickly. So I start something and then I feel, okay, I've done enough. I've done this much, but now I need another challenge. And if I don't get that, I, I don't like stagnation. And so I have to keep pushing myself. And so I know for a fact that I cannot, I cannot be just a parent or just a spouse or just a a journalist. I have to be a lot of things at a lot of times. This is, the, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. I want action. I want forward movement. I want challenge. And uh, I want to always set goals and move towards them. If I don't do it, I get lost. And I don't like being lost. So I'm always setting these deadlines for myself. Nice. That I'm going to finish this in this many days or this many weeks. And that keeps me going. If I don't do it, I feel unmoved. I think I'll sum it up like self-awareness, what you said, self-acceptance, and then self-discovery. And I think these are the three core areas of one's life, which one should keep on doing. It's not self-awareness will not end today. It is like you have to keep on asking yourself, what do you want? Who are you? What are you seeking? It's not like once you get an answer and that's it. Isn't it? I'm sure it's a life. Um, as you grow older, your everything the changes. meaning of things change for you. So absolutely. So thank you. And um, what a lovely person you are. You look beautiful. You are a beautiful person. You are. Thank you again.